Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Shari Kral, and I'm the proud executive director of Streetwise Partners. Thank you for being with us this morning. I have my coffee. My kids are locked in their rooms, hopefully. And I'm so happy to be spending the next hour with you. Before we kick things off, a few technical announcements. All attendees are in listen-only mode, so this means that your microphones are muted. You can use the chat box for any technical issues or general commentary. Feel free to share your LinkedIn URL to stay connected, and please use the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen to submit questions for the panelists. We will monitor these and address them towards the end of our session. We have three events that we are very excited about today, breakfast, lunch, and cocktails. But this event looked very different just three months ago. What was an in-person breakfast fundraiser became virtual with content tailored to the new COVID world. And in the last 10 days, we have seen conversations about race come to the forefront of our community. Conversations that we've been having at Streetwise and working through for years as structural racism pervades every fabric of our society. Our organization was built on the principle of equity. We know that talent is distributed equally, but opportunity is not. Even for those who have hit the traditional milestones, graduating college or a training program are still at a disadvantage because of where they were born, what they look like, or the communities they represent. They lack access to opportunities, professional skills, and social capital. We know there's still so much more that we need to do, but we are proud of our efforts over the past 23 years, aiming towards a society in which hard work and self-determination is enough for job and career success. For those of you who are new to Streetwise, we are one of the only workforce development organizations in the country that offers mentoring to adults. Over a 13-week program, we connect mentees and mentors. Week one is building the career map. Week two is building the resume. Week three is building the LinkedIn profile. Week four is mock interviews and speed networking and elevator pitches and on and on. But because we know it takes a professional community to grow your career, we match every mentee with not one, but up to two mentors to double their network and double their knowledge right from the start. And then every one of these mentoring triads is part of a cohort, a cohort that brings together 25 mentees and 50 mentors. Pre-COVID, when these co cohorts met, it was in the conference rooms of some of the top companies in the world, Morgan Stanley, PwC, Deutsche Bank, KPMG, Today, our cohorts meet virtually with hundreds of mentees and mentors learning and growing together. This is how we close the professional community gap. Today, we have mentored 7,000 adults in New York, DC, and Detroit with the support of 12,000 volunteers. 70% of the people who graduate our program become employed, and even better, their salaries grow on average by 400%. We all know that a job represents more than just a paycheck. It is a sense of purpose. It's your reason to get up in the morning. And given what's going on in the world today, our mission has never been more relevant. I hope you will take a moment during the next hour to consider making a gift and investing in our mentees. We will include a donation link in the chat section of this Zoom call. And thank you to our incredible sponsors who have already shared their generosity. Now, without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce two very special people. Raul Advani is a co-founder of Streetwise and the moderator, moderator for today's event. He is also the founder and CEO of Sir Capital Partners, a firm dedicated to private equity investing in sustainable, environmentally focused, and renewable energy sectors. Paula Yepes is a recent alumni of the Streetwise program. She is an incredible person, a rising junior at Baruch College in New York City, where she studies business administration. I am honored to turn the stage over to Raul and Paula.
for a quick conversation before we move into our HR panel. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Sherry, um, and uh, really appreciate it. Uh, Paula, great to see you again. Um, and uh, uh, just want to say thank you, Sherry, uh, and to everybody that's part of this community. Um, the biggest takeaway that uh, um, I just had already this morning is, is the lessons I've learned over the last 23 years about the importance of mentors, uh, um, the, the damage of stereotypes, and, and the power of, uh, uh, of confidence in everybody. And so uh, one of those examples here is, uh, is Paula and uh, um, uh, uh, had a, a great time uh, getting to know you a little bit. And um, would love for you to maybe just share a little bit of, of, uh, um, of, of how you even got introduced to Streetwise and, and what obstacles uh, you, you know you were facing uh, to, to come over here. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, when I first started college, um, I knew that I wanted to do business. I knew that I wanted to go into finance. I knew that I wanted to, you know, um, I guess go that route but I didn't really understand how many challenges um, I was going to face, especially, you know, in corporate America. So when I first, you know, decided to take on this journey, I spoke to my peers, I spoke to professors, but there was not really that guidance that I was looking for. So then um, I spoke to my mom and up until that point, my mom had been my mentor and everything that I knew, everything that I did, was through my mom but there was a point where you know she could no longer be my mentor or you know there was not i could there was really something that you know i needed beyond her so then um through a program at school i actually found streetwise and it sounded perfect to me because literally everything i wanted streetwise had so you know i was very excited i knew that i you know wanted a mentor i knew that i wanted somebody who you know had experience in that field and so i applied and i got in and you know here i am now that's awesome and so what did uh, um uh, what did the streetwise program uh, uh uh bring to you um that maybe you didn't have before so when I first got into Streetwise, I went in thinking, you know, it was just going to be resumes and mock interviews and, you know, just those kind of things. But I didn't realize how much more Streetwise had to offer. You know, from the moment I met my mentor, we were like so excited to meet one another and you could tell there was like a genuine bond and she just wanted to get to know me, you know. Um, just not, not only professionally, but also personally, you know, and that was something that I was like, okay, wow, you know, um, someone cares, um, you know, and she's showing that she cares. Yeah. So I really got to meet, you know, professionals beyond just suit and ties and really expand my network, you know, um, suddenly I found myself making connections with people that I would never make connections with. Um, I started gaining more confidence. I started talking to more people and, you know, um, I started finding opportunities. So I came across um, an HR recruiter from Bank of America, but I didn't really know how to approach him, you know, how to get a conversation going or any of those, you know, things. But I spoke to my mentor and, you know, I had a high review interview, which I wasn't really familiar with at all. And, um, my mentor really took the time to, you know, coach me through it, even though she wasn't that familiar with it either. But through Streetwise, it's such a big community. And, you know, it's so, you feel so inclined to go and reach out to just anybody and talk to them that the mentors actually decided to jump in and start helping me prepping um, for the interview. And, uh, you know, thankfully, thanks to, you know, thanks to them, thanks to Streetwise, I was able to secure an internship with uh, Bank of America's advisory development program. So I'm very excited for that. That's fantastic. And so um, you have all this momentum going um, and uh, 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 find this entry point. And as Sherry was mentioning, um, all of a sudden we have this new landscape of uh, COVID-19 impacting what we're doing. So um, uh, how have you been through that? And uh, uh, how has, uh, if at all, how has Streetwise helped you through this? 
Right. So it's definitely been different, you know, not something any of us, you know, really knew how to, I guess, deal with. Um, and I'm usually the kind of person that likes to have a schedule. I like to, you know, know what I'm going to do, uh, know how I'm going to do it. And so when this all happened, you know, I didn't have one. So it was difficult for me to, first of all, transition from, you know, my classes being in person to my classes being virtual. And, you know, uh, not only that, but I wasn't really sure if my internship was still going to be um, on. So, you know, after some months of waiting, uh, they finally told us that my internship was going to be virtual. But I honestly, quite frankly, have no idea what that is going to look like. But I'm confident, honestly, that I'm going to ace it and that I'm still going to do, you know, my best. And now more than ever, I have to give it 120, not just 100%. So, you know, um, I definitely took time during all of this to just take a step back and to, you know, just look at a plan, look at the plan I originally had. And, you know, it's honestly looking a little bit different, but I'm really grateful for Streetwise, honestly, because I still know that I have a community and that I was able to build genuine bonds with just, you know, a lot of the mentors. And I know that if there's any point where I need help, I can reach out to, you know, mentors to um, officers to just anybody in the program and actually yesterday I had a conversation with my mentor she just checked in on me and she was like you know how are you doing how's everything so it's it makes me feel supported and like someone cares and someone actually generally wants to help me get through this so you know I'm really looking forward to what the experts have to say today and definitely apply that to my um, career plans. That's uh, 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 so amazing. And uh, uh, Paul, I want to say thank you for taking the time this morning with us. Um, uh, if anybody's ever been in the streetwise um, uh, rooms where we run the programs, uh, sometimes uh, you'll be prone to get chills. And I was getting chills a little bit when, when Paula was sharing kind of, um, uh, you know, everything that she had going and just the energy that you're bringing um, is fantastic. I, no question that uh, um, uh, you're doing everything you need to do to, to make sure you have success um, as much as you can. And so thank you so much and uh, look forward to talking time. to you soon. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Great. Um, so I think now I'm going to uh, continue on um, uh, with the, the panel we have uh, this morning. There we go. And now I see Larry. And so Larry, good morning. We have a, uh, uh, a panel uh, this morning that's lining up. I've, I don't think I've ever been um, uh, uh, able to have such a group of uh, experts in one place talk about what's going on in the world with you, Larry, with what you're seeing um, uh, uh, on, a, on a macro level. Uh, you're with Gallup. You're talking to all of the leading HR um, uh, leaders across the country, if not globally, and um, would love to, um, uh, we'll start with what's going on there. Uh, we'll talk to Maggie about um, uh, uh, where we go, uh, and then also with Rachel about how we get there. But uh, uh, maybe starting with you, Larry, um, uh, what are you seeing from uh, the HR teams and leaders across the country today in this new world? Yeah, good morning, everybody. It's uh, it's really great to be here. I am, um, yeah, you know, I've been with Gallup 27 years. We do a lot of things, but most of what we do is help companies build better workplaces and and uh, engage their people and make them productive and all that. But uh, when I'm speaking today from a different body of content, about three years ago, I started building what has become by far the world's largest uh, organization of big company chief human resource officers. I call it CHRO Roundtable. Uh, it now has 770 of them from around the world, and, and these are big companies. They actually average about $23 billion in revenue and 80,000 people. So, uh, uh, pa Paola, wow. uh, of, course, of course, the CHRO of Bank America, uh, Sherry Bronstein, was one of my original members, and I know her quite well. Um, so, when COVID-19 hit, what I used to do is travel around the world. Uh, I'm kind of bummed because I had another year where I was going to be in all kinds of cities around the world. Uh, bringing them together in small groups, usually for a day to day and a half, to talk about what you can imagine they would talk about, the kind of typical HR uh, issues. And, and, and um, when COVID-19 hit, uh, I immediately pivoted, like everybody else, to virtual. 
And what I've been doing for the past three months is uh, having, I, I used to do multi-industry meetings, but in a COVID-19 situation, you learn real quickly that it's more productive to bring together CHROs who are in the same industry. Because uh, someone who's in hospitality or airlines, you know, who's been totally shut down, you know, it, it's not very helpful for them to be in a meeting with, let's say, uh, uh, essential retail like grocery stores who are fully operating. So I broke them into about 15 industry groups. And um, over the past three months, I've now done 55 uh, 90 minute uh, VCs uh, talking about, and they usually average about 20 of these mega CHROs. Some have been quite a bit bigger, but benchmarking how they best respond to the, to the crisis. An example was yesterday, I had three of them, one with big technology CHROs, another with pharmaceutical and medical device CHROs, and, and the third with financial services CHROs. They were supposed to be meetings on COVID-19 issue. I will tell you that we completely turned to talk about racial inequality and what large companies can do uh, with a lot of open humbleness about how much better they have to be, uh, especially at diversity and senior positions and those kinds of things. But um, but but for today, I'll, I'll move back to our, our other topic. Um, the um, you know uh, I'm going to move very quickly here to get to what does it mean to all of you. Uh, when I started doing these, uh, over 500 major CHROs have been in these video conferences the past three months. Most of them to many, uh, and um, you know they keep coming back to their industry ones. You know we started out in March with dealing with the crisis. In April we started moving into talking about how are we going to return people who we sent remote back to the workplace or people who were coming back because we're beginning to open up again. Uh, and, we, and then we moved in to, uh, in May, um, talking almost exclusively about where do, what does this all mean to the way we're gonna operate differently uh, in the future. And let me, let me make a few comments um, about that. Um, clearly, you guys know the broad trends. Remote works better than we knew. Virtual works better than we knew. Uh, and, uh, and, and what does that mean long term? I'll give you a couple extreme examples. Now, these are extreme, and we'll see if, how many go to this. One of the big U.S. banks, I'll leave them unnamed, but they're uh, one of the big five or six largest banks in the United States, like, you know, close to 100,000 people, fairly global, although they're, they're primarily domestic. But you know, before the uh, COVID-19, they had only 1% of their workforce working remote, 100% remote, just 1%. Their post-COVID-19 plan is 25% of their workforce who are 100% remote. Another 50% they call hybrid, which means you'll come to work some of the time, but maybe only like a day a week, maybe two days a week. So only 25% of their workforce are people that will mainly come to offices. So you think about from 1% remote to 75% uh, totally or largely remote, you're talking about, if I do the numbers real quickly, you know, about 75,000 people versus 1,000 people. That's a massive, massive shift. And I have another one, another one, a, a big healthcare system in the United States. Obviously, their clinical roles in their hospitals, in their clinics have to be on site. But they have several thousand um, non-clinical employees, and they are seriously considering having none of those people ever come back to an office again, including their headquarters. Now, those are extreme cases, and we'll see what happens over time, um, and I'll make a comment about that, about that later. The other thing that's interesting is, um, in terms of you know, what the reality is gonna look like, is even those companies who do plan to bring most of their workforce back to workplaces, every week that goes by, the complexity of doing that seems to get larger. And so the one trend that's happening is the return to workplace timing, and it's different in every geography, both here in the United States, and most of my members are very global companies, so their timing is very different around the world. The closer they get to it, the farther they keep pushing it out. Um, and the more they realize that we're not, you know, we're gonna bring fewer and fewer people back than we thought. Now, that's going to continue for, uh, for a long time. The other thing that's interesting um, is it's forcing the big companies of the world, and I'm sure it's forcing all companies of the world, I just operate with the big ones, to really rethink what is the purpose of the workplace at all. 
why do we bring people to workplaces? The reality is in a lot of workplaces, people come, go in their cubicles and are kind of disappear for the day. And then, well, that's not, they could have done that at home, right? So they're really rethinking. I and mean, one of the terms that I'm hearing is we need our workplaces to be destinations, almost like it's like a, a vacation place, right? Why, what go, can we do here? What, what activities uh, can happen at our workplaces um, that make people want to be here, that makes it more productive for them to be here uh, than versus just be at home. Last comment I'll make before I make some comments about what it means to all of you, I think, is um, there's, um, well, let me, let me just move on to, 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 to just keep my time and move on to the, the way forward. Here's one thing. This remote thing is going to go for a long time and there are aspects of remote that are gonna go for a very long time. Uh, Paola uh, mentioned that she was interviewed by uh, using the, the platform of HireVue. Um, I will tell you that what I'm hearing is even when people come back to work, the effectiveness of interviewing people and even hiring them entirely remote, virtual, without ever having an in-person meeting means that even after we do all this, I think that will be a primary way of hiring. That means all of you have to get good at virtual video interview. And you've got to work on the details. How do you look? You know, how are there no distractions? Uh, you got to practice uh, uh, how you come across. You, you have to learn how to be confident in that setting. Because I think for your next job, the job after the job after, in many cases, uh, you will be doing it virtually. Um, that, that's this is pretty one. terrifying, uh, Larry. We, we, to me, I hear it kind of from, almost two, from two ways. One is a CEO of, of my own business where I have to think about um, uh, uh, managing my teams differently and how we're going to get our job done. And then also, uh, uh, you know, as, as somebody who's, who's working on the team, the challenges of working from home, you know, I now have to make sure that I get kids out of the house. Uh, like you said, I have a clean enough house. I have the internet connectivity. Um, is this, uh, um, are the standards already, is there already a baseline standard set that you see of professionalism around this or is it all still happening in real time? No, you know, one of the great things that has happened and these CHROs talk about it a lot is because we all came into everybody's homes and we're all we're doing Zoom calls and all that, it's given leaders and companies a much better understanding of the reality of the lives of their people, regardless of COVID-19 and the things that, that you have to deal. And, and this gets to my second recommendation to all of you. One of the big decisions you need to make as you look for your next job is what works for you. Are you someone who can work remotely, who likes to work remotely, right? And if so, then you know you can pursue jobs where that's possible. If you're someone who cannot work remotely because of the environment you're in, not productively, or simply don't like to work remotely, you need to factor that into the kind of jobs you look for. One of the cool things that's happened, and maybe this will be my last point uh, before you know maybe answering a question or two later, is this: in the in the first you know month and a half of all my video conferences. The companies were talking about real sophisticated algorithms about how we're going to decide who maybe stays remote longer, whoever, and who comes back. You can imagine what that would be. You know, what jobs are more likely to be most productive? What kind of people are most likely to be productive, remote or not remote? The companies have thrown all those algorithms out the door. The mathematics now is real simple. Are people that have learned they like remote and think they can be productive remote Let's do what we can to enable that indefinitely, if not forever. Our people that don't like to work remote, can't work remote, and want to come back to work, you know, let's see what we can do to make that possible. And that's the mathematics have gotten real simple, but it's cool because it means we're really thinking first about the lives of our people and how do we integrate their, their work with us into those, you know, those realities. Maybe that's uh, that's enough, Rahul. Yeah, no, Larry. That's a. Uh, um, I think that's a great framework, and um, really feel blessed to get get some of your perspective. I I, I don't know that uh, you could ever get the perspective of seven hundred uh, HR 
people representing such massive companies in one it's, place. Uh, it's crazy, Rahul. I know more large company CHROs than anybody in the world by a long shot, just because of the unique design of this thing that I've created. I can tell you that they're really good people and their heart's in the right place. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, well, it's, uh, uh, we're all navigating these challenges. And, uh, you, you know, as we're reminded, it's uh, a lot is breaking in real time and we're all learning together. And so thank you, Larry. And, and we'll circle back with you uh, if we have questions at the end. Um, we're, we're blessed on the panel this morning to also have uh, Maggie Mistal on, who's a, uh, uh, a career consultant, uh, an executive con a coach, and uh, um, uh, just a, um, uh, a phenomenal media personality. Um, odds are, if, you're, if you've tuned into the radio or uh, 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 television over the last uh, uh, number of years, you've caught Maggie. And we were actually reminiscing a little bit earlier. I don't know that Maggie uh, knew that I remembered this, but uh, Maggie gave Streetwise its very first media attention um, that we ever received almost uh, 15 years ago. And so it's, uh, it's great to see you this morning. Um, uh, Pleasure uh, to be Maggie. here. It's great to see things. Things continue to grow and, and shift. And I, as I was saying to you before, you know, preparation for today, Streetwise is needed now more than ever, Rahul. So to be part of the inception of this great organization is a real pleasure. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so, uh, so Larry um, did a lot to frame. Well, these big companies now who manage a lot of a lot of us are changing. Um, they have to, um, and uh, uh, there's this whole idea of working remotely now. And so I think about um, the career tracks that we want to take, and, and a lot of it is tied to mentoring and, and, and getting and, and, and watching and learning immersively. Um, but now that's different, and how I find my job is going to be a little bit different. And so um, uh, how monumental a shift do you think we have at this point in time in trying to um, uh, find a career for ourselves? Well, what's interesting is that <clears throat> the outside world has shifted, but what I loved about what Larry was saying is that it's coming back to the individual. And in my experience, Rahul, it's always been about going inside yourself to find your passion and then the doors will open for you, the right doors. And those doors may be at home <laughs> through your computer, <laughs> but you don't have to necessarily you know, only focus on what companies want or what, <clears throat> excuse me, the workforce is demanding. It, really what you wanna do is get into the, the micro details of yourself, right? And what, what matters to you. I, I call it soul search. And, and I'll tell you, when I work with people to figure out their, their careers and their path, which so many people are reassessing right now, more than 80% of the time that I spend with them is on figuring out who they are and testing out that hypothesis, you know, to get that kind of clarity. Because when people get clear on who they are, and you heard Larry say it, right? He's like, well, where do you want to work? And where do you work best, right? When you get that clarity for yourself, and you see with Paola too, and her confidence, right? She really feels like she knows who she is. That's when I've seen opportunities really present themselves. And they're, they're almost magically aligned. Um, and people think they have to work so hard to figure it out and find it and look through a you know, thousand different job postings. It's not, in my experience, it's not like that. It's more about looking inside yourself and getting that reflection right. Then your relaunch is happen, you know, happens in a way that's really aligned with who you are and the work you're here to do. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting. I, uh, um, uh, that sounds on the one hand easy, uh, but on the other hand, very hard. Um, and almost like, is that, um, is that too much of a luxury that maybe many of us can't afford, right? Of, um, of thinking of, well, what is it that I really want to be doing versus what is it that I need to be doing? And so how does that balance work into this um, as, we're, um, uh, as we really want to find kind of um, a stable career over the long term? What's fascinating, Raul, do you know I've been working on careers for as long as you guys have been working on things with Streetwise, right? <laughs> yeah. And when people try to turn away from what they really want to do and think, oh, I can't do that, that's a luxury, I have to do this other thing, it never works. And all I do is find more struggle. All I do is find more problems. All I do is find you know, more obstacles. It's not a luxury. In fact, it's a necessity to really go after what you want. And, and it's amazing because we used to have all these excuses, right, as to why we couldn't do that. Well, I don't have the time or, you know, I don't, you know, I don't have the access. And look at between organizations like Streetwise and between now what's happened with staying at home and basically a lot of activities stopping, we, don't, we have the time. We have the time to reflect on who we are and what we'd really love to do. We also have world events, global events happening that are making us 
be, you know, really get in touch with our own values and what's important to us. We can't ignore it anymore. It's almost like yeah. th th it's coming to us to say, you have to follow your passion. This is what we're demanding of you. And that's honestly, it's, it's, it's amazing because people only think careers are a struggle because they're not following their passion. I've never seen it the other way. And you know, when people are on the right path, I'll tell you, the door's open and people may think, well, that's not the right door or I'm scared to walk through that door or that door makes me feel vulnerable because I got to put myself out there in new ways. But that's okay. That's why organizations like Streetwise exist. That's why I am here to help people. You know, the courage is part of that. And, and there's, there's a lot of uh, courageous individuals that we get to see right now too that are really rising to the occasion. So I think it's exciting times. Yeah, and so, so um, what happens where, you know, I'm going through the soul search and um, if anybody else can relate to this, uh, you, you know, I kind of, I just don't know. I have this feeling of like, you know, I don't know that I, I need a job and, uh, you, you know, there's a lot of things I could be good at. I need a chance, right? Um, how do I balance, um, uh, you, you know, trying to find a, a true purpose of where, you know, I'll, I'll find happiness and, um, versus getting the chance and learning what's out there and, uh, um, and growing that way? Um, how do you kind of use, um, balance that aspect when you're going through this, you think, right now? Sure. Well, I had a mentor <laughs> early on in my own career, and I said the same thing. I'm like, I don't know if I like this work. He said, Maggie, it's okay. Give it, you know, get miles on you, he called it. Uh, and I had another mentor at another time when I tried coaching. You know, I was like, I don't know if co coaching is even right for me. She said, just try it, right? That's the, the second step after soul search is research, and that's testing it out for yourself. And, and you have to have the experiences to know that. And you might find out you're wrong. <laughs> you might find out you made a mistake. My first career was accounting. That was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> and it's okay. And I want all the folks listening, especially your mentees at Streetwise, to know that you know, there's no real failure anymore. And it, that, I think, is so freeing and so amazing. I just interviewed a recruiter on my podcast, and she said the same thing. She said, now is the time to try new things because everybody's trying new things. Everybody, even you heard it from Larry, even the biggest companies in the world right now are figuring this out and trying new things. Nobody has the answers. So if you have an inclination, this is one thing I will say, when it comes to getting experience, still try to align. Even uh, you know, whatever you do know about yourself, if you just feel more excited about one project or one opportunity or one internship over another, follow the excitement. Because that energy is real and that energy will last for you. And that's what's going to be the motivation to, you know, get out of bed every day doing that career. If you don't follow the excitement, if you follow something else, a lot of times what I've seen is it starts to lose the energy and you start to get yourself into career trouble. So I would say it's okay to get lots of miles on you. Just follow the excitement to start. Yeah. And so, I, um, uh, so right now, um, uh, do you have any day-to-day -day tips on um, whether I'm adapting to working from home and looking for a new job or whether I don't have a job right now and uh, um, looking for it from my home right now. Um, uh, what are the most practical, tangible tips you can give us right now that could maybe um, uh, uh, get us the farthest ahead, so to speak? Sure. Well, I would say pay attention. Pay attention and get specific, right? Because Again, what I've seen is when you get the reflection right, the relaunch, which you're going to hear about in, you know, in a few minutes, that is much easier, right? Because you're already aligned. So reflect right now. Take a moment. before. Don't just run headlong into activities and tasks. Take a step back and, and again, do a, do a check. How am I feeling today? Am I excited about this project that I'm working on or I'm not excited? What aspect about it excites me? Get into the details. I have found, Rahul, that the details are what really make the difference in, in clarity. It's a granular level. And I, I encourage people to think about what times of, uh, we call it times of ecstatic engagement. We like to get dramatic in coaching, but it's times when you loved what you were doing, when it, it, it felt like you were in the flow and you lost track of time, right? It's you want to understand and notice those things about yourself. Notice when you feel motivated to do something. And also, you know, one of the things I tell people is write down your ideal day. Even if, you know, even if you're like, you're not sure how you're going to get it, Write down what it is you'd like to see happen. Would you like to have, if you're going to work from home, what would you ideally love to see that look like? And most people at first look at me like, well, I don't know if I could, you know, I don't know if I can get that. I'm like, don't worry if you can get it. Tell me what it is because you've got it. What they say, shoot for the moon so you can fall, land amongst the stars, right? You've got to really go for it. So that ideal day is one of the core activities. 
that I have seen people, not only when they write down, do they give themselves a chance to create it, they literally end up living it. So it's really crucial right now. And that includes, you know, I, I saw some comments about childcare, right? If you want to have a, a great work from home environment because that works for you, wonderful. If you don't, if you want to be in an office, we are going to go back in some way. It may take a long time or it may look differently, but there's going to be options available to you. And what you want to do is set yourself up now knowing what your ideal looks like and you couldn't find it. Literally, I keep an ideal vision next to my desk you know, next to my computer on my desk. And when I, when I find something, I, I hear somebody else is doing and I like it, I'm like, ooh, that's a good idea. And I write it into my vision, okay? Write it in the present tense as if it's yours and that's a really smart, actually very practical way to create what you want. Maggie, I, uh, um, uh, I was taking notes for myself here. So it, it's a, uh, um, this is fantastic. But the idea uh, that my takeaways of what you said were, look inward, right? If this is what you can do, right? Really figure out uh, uh, what it is you want to do. Have that vision. Um, uh, uh, visualizing your goals is critical. I, I've gone through the same exercise, whether it's your ideal day or five years out. Yeah, you put it down and on look paper. look at you now. <laughs> you put it out there and uh, the universe may find a way to, to bend towards that. And so, uh, and then you said also two other things, which were um, kind of accept that there is this uncertainty and have that positive outlook, right? And I think that those are all really, uh, uh, it's a phenomenal equation. So thank you. Um, I want to um, uh, uh, stick around. We're going to come back for a Q&A with, uh, with everybody that will all have the opportunity um, um, uh, to talk to, um, with all of us collectively here. Um, but um, uh, I want to turn now to um, uh, Rachel Pellegrini, um, if uh, um, uh, we could get... Uh, um, uh, connected here, and uh, uh, I know Rachel's uh, um, uh, a Boston Red Sox fan. Hopefully, we'll have um, uh, the season um, start off. I'm a Mets fan, and so um, uh, uh, figured it's a, a little bit of spring and um, talking baseball. But you're also the um, COO of, uh, of, of Justin Bradley, and, and do a lot of work around uh, um, contingent workforces. And um, uh, Rachel, you know, we've talked a little bit high level on from Larry on what's going on, a little bit from Maggie on, on you know, how do we really kind of respond um, and, and have the kind of career kind of coaching tips now. Um, where do we go next? How do you think we get there? What are the sectors that we look for? And, and, and how do we really structure that kind of um, aspect to position ourselves best? Okay. No, good morning, all, and I'm good definitely morning. looking forward to um, baseball coming back and huge yes. fan. So, um, I guess let me just start by telling you a little bit about my background, and it's completely relevant to where we're at today. So, um, I am the CEO and partner at Justin Bradley. Um, we are a staffing firm focusing on finance, accounting, business professional talent, both on the contract as well as direct hire nationwide. But I actually graduated college in the year 2000. So as some of you may or may not know, that was the beginning of the dot-com bust. So I ended up spending 18 months in my job search and bartending on the side. And how I secured my first opportunity was by having conversations. And I clearly remember it to this day. I had sent my resume out there. I had tried every vehicle. I'd mailed my resume because it was the beginning of the World Wide Web, <laughs> so way back when. And I remember sitting out on the front stoop of an apartment building, my apartment building in Boston, having a conversation with a neighbor upstairs. And I'm like, I, I am struggling. I can't find a position. It's been 15 months. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And she's like, you know what? We're hiring. We are a mutual fund company. It's Evergreen Investments. We're hiring. Let me submit your resume and see what happens. Now, I will tell you this, I had no idea what a mutual fund was. I was a psych major, so I had no idea what finance was <laughs> at the time. And I got an interview and then it was up to me. And I will tell you, I secured the opportunity. I spent two years learning about something that I had no idea what I was getting into. And it led me to a career where I am today. So Justin Bradley, I ended up at Justin Bradley because of my financial services background. And it's through just conversations and networking that really has brought me success. So that kind of leads me to what you can do on a day-to-day -day basis, the tangible things. So, you know, Maggie talked about figuring out what's important to you and your strengths. So what are the next steps from there? Now that you know what you want to do, have your resume reflect that. You know, your resume is that first step 
to say, okay, this is who I am. That's your only opportunity in some cases for somebody to look at you. So step one is making sure you have three to five people look at your resume, check for errors, make sure it makes sense. Make sure they know you the best, you know, whether it be family members, friends, mentors, use people to take a really hard look at what you want to be and where you want to go and get their feedback. You'd be surprised about how many people in your community and in your network really want to help you out. So that's number one, make sure it's clear, concise, and you have that polished reflection of yourself. And then also along those lines, make sure it matches your LinkedIn profile. So if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, step one should be making sure you set that up. That should be coming out from today. If you don't have one, make sure you set your LinkedIn profile up. And then if you already have one, revisit it. So the biggest thing and the biggest mistake people make is not updating it and having it be stale. So LinkedIn is a way as a recruiter where we look for candidates. You know, we're looking for individuals who have a specific skill set, specific technologies, specific company experience. So make sure your LinkedIn profile is reflective of where you want to be, who you want to be. And just going to the basics, make sure you have a picture there. And your picture should be just like you see us today. Plain background, doesn't have to be a professional headshot, just something, you know, just make sure it's, you know, maybe not a selfie, but somebody takes it on from a phone picture, that's 100% okay. But make sure it's really a reflection of yourself and who you want to be because that's what people see. You know, if you're going, if you wanna be in the creative field, make sure your profile picture rec, you know, reflects your energy, your excitement, your creativity. If you're going into finance, kind of like Paolo was talking about, you know, making sure that you have that business professional attire in your profile. So those are things that you really wanna think of. These are small things, but they're really important. And then as you go through your LinkedIn profile, make sure it matches your resume. So I will tell you, one of the biggest- I was gonna actually ask that question <laughs> because I've actually seen companies now that say as a service, we'll take resumes of your candidates and test it against what they put online. And if there's a gap or there's a difference, you might have a red flag. And so um, any of us might have periods of time that aren't LinkedIn worthy, that I'll call it, right? That I don't want to post that period on there. How, how, how do we think about that when we're trying to put forth who we are today and, and, and uh, what we're looking for? Well, I will say this, you know, the, the biggest thing is, you know, I, I do see what you're saying. So I probably don't have bartending. I bartended for six years. It's not on my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> um, it was many years ago, but I have everything since that time. Um, I would say, if, if, know what's relevant, but make sure it does match. So if your resume leaves out, um, you know, your restaurant experience, make sure your LinkedIn profile also leaves that out. Um, you could put it as other experience on the bottom. That's also something if you want to use it as a connection networking um, capability, because I do know for me personally, I still keep in touch with professionally and personally with people I have worked with in completely different industries 20 plus years ago. So, but I will say this, that is, you know, when I get a resume, I take a look at their LinkedIn profile, see if they have one. Um, if there's big discrepancies, I'll usually ask a candidate about that. You know, I'll take a look at the resume, take a look at the LinkedIn and say, you know, how come these don't match up? You know, can you, can you walk me through why these don't match up? You want to make sure that's not the first question that comes at you, though. You want to make sure that the first question that comes at you is, okay, I see you have this great internship at Bank of America. Tell me about how it was working virtually. You know, what was that experience like? That's what you want your first question to be from a hiring leader. So you really should make sure that all media is mm -hmm. consistent. Your resume, your, it's your brand, it's who you are. And it's really important because you know you best. And the last thing I would say to that, so you have your LinkedIn profile now, you have your resume, make sure you can talk about it. <laughs> so one of the biggest areas where we see candidates fall is when we pick up the phone and I say, you know, I got your resume. I'd love to hear about your background. Tell me your story. So it goes to the elevator pitch. You know, we started off this, you know, Streetwise talks about the elevator pitch. I can't tell you how important it is to have that down pat. When I ask a candidate, 
you know, tell me about yourself. And they say, wait, I have to get my resume. You lived this. This is you. I want to hear about you. I want to hear your story because that's what's going to drive me to know what companies are going to be a fit for you. And that's really important. So practice in front of the mirror, practice in the car, practice when you're walking down the street. You hear people on the phone all the time. So people aren't going to know if you're on the phone or not. Practice talking to yourself while you're walking the dog. But just be prepared to have it in your memory. You know, one of the sessions I've taken as a hiring manager earlier on in my career is you want to make sure that it's kind of in your short term memory. So your recall is quick. So whether you're nervous, whether you're the type of person who's not comfortable talking about yourself, if you've practiced it and you're familiar with the content, your recall is a lot quicker and you're able to recall it without thinking too much. So that's really, really important. It's really practice. And also sometimes another tip that I learned, and this could be helpful, look in the mirror. When you're talking about yourself, practice in front of the mirror because especially today with everything being via webcam, Zoom, you really wanna know how people are visualizing yourself. You wanna practice your facial cues, you wanna practice your hand signals. I talk with my hands and I still do to this day, but that's something you wanna think about. These are distracting things that could make or break an interview. You, you know, Rachel, it's a, um, uh, you mentioned look in the mirror. Um, uh, I've, I've been given advice to record myself, um, giving the, my pitch on myself or whatever it may be. And uh, um, you can do it pretty easily with the iPhone. It's hard to do. I hate watching myself. It's uh, cringeworthy. I'm like, oh, nobody <laughs> should ever interact with me after you watch it. But um, it sounds like that, uh, um, I know it's a concluding point, but, but I think that that could be a, a differentiator, right? When we're all looking for differentiators here. Um, so, so thank you very much, Rachel. And, and I'm happy to report that um, for everybody who's uh, um, uh, on here with us is, is that we're tracking well on time and uh, have left room um, for um, ample uh, uh, Q&A. And so maybe what I could do is uh, have our fellow panelists uh, pop back up. And uh, um, we have a Q&A function um, that's uh, part of here um, with, uh, um, with Zoom. And I'm not certain that um, everybody here um, can see this, but um, Mary, maybe I'll start with Larry um, uh, on the macro level. And there's a, a little bit of a question around uh, the issue of childcare, right? Oh. You're talking about the priority and everybody's going to be coming into my home. And so now my HR managers and my employers are going to say, I don't have it under control. Um, what could you do or what are companies going to do to, to help us with this if they're going to ask us to do our jobs from where we need to live? Yeah, I saw that pop up when I was talking. I almost answered it then. Literally in every one of the video conferences I've done over the past three months, we've touched on this issue. And the answer as far as what big companies are doing is it depends on who you are. It depends on how much money you have. And so the, the up to now in the past three months, the companies that have added ch some kind of child care benefit as something they offer have really up to now been, been primarily the essential retailers and the healthcare systems. So uh, those that have needed to keep their people on the front lines, either for health care or, you know, in the grocery stores and all that. And, no, and, and, and um, have added uh, health uh, child care benefit. It's ranged from buying packages with people like Kinder Care and Bright Horizons and all that who've been offering in-home child care services since their centers are, are closed uh, uh, to just cash. You know, a common number I've heard for many is, uh, is on any day that someone needs child care, we're just going to give you a hundred bucks and you figure out how to use it. Uh, there's been something creative in the healthcare systems because, you know, they're really struggling financially because uh, uh, of the non-essential uh, uh, procedures and all that they couldn't do for a while. And now people are still afraid to have uh, done. They did a deal that was really cool. Many of them were they they created private Facebook pages of all their own employees who offered up high school students or, co or college students that are home from college or or anybody to kind of crowdsource their own uh, child care support. In some cases, that would also be subsidized by the company. In some cases, they said, could you guys just do that on a volunteer basis, at least for today? And, and, and they're having great success with it, by the way. So um, will more offer that in the future? Um, it's just, I, I think it's gonna, be, it's gonna be based on who you are and based on how much you can afford to do it. I'll just give you one example and I'll close. One of the healthcare systems 
uh, turned on the ability for their people uh, to use the uh, uh, bright horizons uh, for childcare. And they didn't know how much it'd get used and they didn't monitor it. And uh, Bright Horizons called them because they had already spent $20 million. And they, there was a, a, a number the way beyond what they expected. They had to back off and go, okay, wait a second. We got to rethink exactly what we can do here. Uh, and I mean, it's like $20 million in like a month, right? So, uh, but it'll be interesting to see where they go. Um, I do think a number of them are wondering about how to incorporate that into at least a benefit choice you can make. Now, a, a, a lot of talk has been around um, adapting to um, working from home and working remotely, but there's a huge part of our economy that just can't do that, right? And uh, um, whether it's essential workers, um, but, but that's clearly um, a, a group that's going to not continue to do the same thing because we're in a different landscape, but forge ahead and almost seem like they're forging ahead in an almost... Um, uh, um, and, and I'd open it up to Larry, Rachel, or Maggie, is are these two almost different career tracks that we're now looking at? Of, I want to be maybe um, somebody who's more professional services, knowledge related, working from uh, home versus uh, whether it's an office or customer service, um, you, you know, in-person customer service that um, is in-person versus virtual actually going to be a defining career track for us. I don't, I haven't seen it with my clients that it's completely separate that way because even the financial services or professional services knowledge worker wants to see people sometime <laughs> beyond their family, <laughs> you know? So I, I would caution people to define it that uh, specifically or, or, you know, in, in terms of saying like I have to choose one or the other and I would get very individualized about again, what's going to make you most productive. That's what I'm seeing in the questions. You know, people are wondering, all right, if people, you know, if we're going to have our employees work from home, are they productive? Are they creative? How do we measure their engagement? And again, I think that's exciting to put on the worker's plate to say, well, what's going to keep you engaged and excited? And is that going to sometimes be some office work? I know for me, I like a hybrid and I'm hearing a lot of that from my clients. Yeah. And so Rachel is, uh, um, uh, I guess, workers or, 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 or companies, uh, if I'm coming to an employer, um, they've never met me before. Um, all I have is, uh, um, the, you know, the background, some pieces of paper, maybe a reference or two from Streetwise, but will that really get me a job when um, I've been putting all this emphasis on, on, on making that good in-person impression? Is, uh, um, uh, can I get a job without the in-person interview right now? So I would say yes. And part of that is just being prepared, doing your research. This, this environment is the one chance you get to be yourself, be who you are. So be confident in your experience, your capabilities, and really know the company. So one of the big things, Maggie touched on it a little bit earlier, um, about making sure your values align with the mission of the organization. Because even if you're interviewing via video for a position that might not be the best fit, if that company's values do not align with your own internal values, it won't work out. So make sure going into that you know, WebEx, Zoom interview, you've done your research. You know the projects the company is working on. You know the initiatives that are out there. The biggest area, and this is similar to actually just historically, whether it's in person or video, that's always gonna be your differentiator, is speaking with confidence, knowing where the camera is and knowing the company and person you're interviewing with. So do your research. I would say that is the most important thing going into an interview. Your resume got you there, streetwise your references got you there, but now it's in your hands to really be prepared. And there's so much information out there. You can go to LinkedIn and find, okay, you know, who are you interviewing with? what is their background and do you have any connections? Do you volunteer with the same organizations? Are you, you know, did you go to the same college? Did you go to the same high school? You're from similar areas. Do you know similar people? I mean, these are things that you really wanna make sure going in, you're ready to answer, you're ready to make that connection. So that would be my advice. Um, you will get hired. Um, we've actually seen this pre our current environment, pre COVID-19. We've had many candidates hired just off of um, WebEx interviews, and this has been happening for years, and that has always been our advice, and that will continue going forward. Um, so just be prepared. That's great. 
Larry, you mentioned um, $100 a day for childcare. Um, and now I'm starting to think about salaries, pay, what's going to happen on that level. Um, you're talking to me about now I have to make my background nice, uh, you know, to, to be professional at home. Um, I may need two devices now because I might have a laptop but to use my computer yeah. and also look at the same time. So is my pay going to increase or because there's less stuff happening, is my pay going to decrease? Yeah, on, on the company side, it again, it depends on who you are and what you can afford. Uh, but, you know, I've heard a lot of things for, for home working. There's been ranging from, hey, you know, it, we just everyone's got to figure out on their own to companies that are, are providing significant levels of support. Uh, one is just tell us what you think you need and we'll, we'll accept all reasonable requests. Uh, I had one company that just simply offered everybody $500 to spend as they, they think best works for their environment. Um, a lot of them are letting, you know, have let people go to the office and take home their workstations. And uh, so, but, th but that issue is kind of unresolved because so example, for those people that, that in their work, they need larger than just a laptop. Are we going to go ahead and give them, you know, provide one at home and provide one? The, I, can, I can tell you that I would say for a lot of companies, the answer is yes. They probably mm -hmm. will over time add as a new benefit of, of making sure that you are productive at home with what you need. What happens to travel, in-person interactions? It's the near term we're talking about. Um, you, you know, Larry, you were talking about there's, uh, you, you know, companies that was once 1% remote now going up to 25% remote. You, you, you know, um, uh, what does that really mean for our day-to-day -day interactions? Yeah, I'll, if I'll if I project comment. out a year. Yeah, yeah I, let's project out a year. The reality is it's a lot easier to do this when you already know each other. And as you start hiring new people and all that, you're going to have to find ways to bring people back in person. Because, and then once you bond and all that, maybe you can be productive remote. But I think I think everyone's going to pull back because we just what we know about human nature. Yeah, it's great. I uh, um, we I think we are coming to the uh, um, the conclusion. I'm I'm looking at uh, um, uh, some of the questions that we have coming in. And uh, I'll pick one of them maybe for, for last comments from, from each of you. Um, uh, and maybe each of you can give your one best idea. Um, what soft skill should people be looking to develop now? Um, uh, and uh, so, so each one of you, I'll, um, I'll, I'll start with you, Maggie, uh, then go to you, Rachel, and then, go, and then finish up with you, Larry. I would say courage. Because we, we, yes, we're all living in a different world than the one we were just a few months ago, and it's going to keep changing as we, you know, work out this new new world that we're living in. So I'd encourage or encourage people to be courageous um, and assess who they are, who they want to be, and to really go after it. Because this is a time, you know, when this is, we build monuments to people who who during times like this do something, <laughs> right? That yep. matters. That's important. That speaks to their values. So this is your chance. To really you know, make a Courage. huge difference. Courage. Courage. Okay, Rachel? I would say kind of piggybacks on that, but confidence. Know who okay. you are. Know how to communicate who you are. That you are your best advocate and you know yourself best. So talk about yourself with confidence. Perfect. And I would say, I would say strengths. Every one of you has some natural strengths, things that you've always naturally done well since you were a little kid. If you can get insight on what those are and find a job that leverages those, it makes doing a great work easy. Yeah, that's a, uh, uh, Larry, that's a great ending point. Thank you for that. Because one of the, sometimes even I forget that all of us have to play to our own strengths. We look to other models, but at the end of the day, the true strength, it's something that Maggie was saying, it's, it is inside us and that's what uh, uh, is important here. I want to thank you, Rachel and Larry and Maggie. You guys did amazing preparation. I'll tell you a scene behind the scenes. Everybody was on top of it. Uh, Paula, thank you so much for sharing your energy with us. Sherry, um, uh, uh, thank you for keeping me part of your uh, awesome organization here. Um, and Nicole and, and others on the team for helping us um, pull this all off. Um, uh, amazing amount of effort. Uh, that even I saw far away from the office, kind of in their own homes. So um, <laughs> thanks to everybody here this morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, Good luck, Thank everybody. you. Thank you, Raul, our incredible panelists. Thank you to all of you for your engagement, your incredible questions, your um, interest in getting 
connected through LinkedIn. Um, myself and my team, we'd love to hear from you. So please reach out to us through LinkedIn, Facebook, email. Um, you can get involved by joining the program, by referring somebody to the program, volunteering with the program, or hiring our mentees. As you see, we have an incredible uh, pipeline of talent that is waiting to be tapped. Um, you know, these are tough times and we are committed to supporting and strengthening our community. So we hope that you'll, you'll become a part of it. We will keep the donation link in the chat in case you'd like to invest in our work. And I have to make one more plug for you to join us at 5 p.m. We have another event, uh, which is with cocktails rather than coffee. We're featuring a fireside chat with Service Max's CEO, Neil Brewer, and General Atlantic President, Anton Levy, which is being moderated by ESPN's Michelle Steele. So we've included the link to that event as well. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.